Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to remind you, as you're making your travel plans for the summer, Remember johnnydollarair.com, whether it's a hotel, a rental car, an airline ticket, or even a cruise reservation, going to johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate, so you get all the benefits of going through Priceline and being able to name your own price on hotels, rental cars, or airline tickets, or being able to choose from published fares. Plus, part of your purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So when you're uh, making those plans, remember johnnydollarair.com first. So now let's go ahead and we'll take a listen to today's episode, The Rasmussen Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, my name is Hardy, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'm returning the call you made to Mr. Ellis Rasmussen. If you will state your business, I shall be glad to transmit it to him. You tell Mr. Rasmussen I'm an insurance investigator from Hartford and the matter involves a member of his own family. Oh, uh, young Mr. Rasmussen? Yes. Uh, Oh, uh, could you hold on a moment, sir? I could. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen will send a car for you at six o'clock. Look, I can take a cab. Oh, well. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Rasmussen matter. Expense account item one, $204.35, airfare from Hartford to San Francisco to Los Angeles. Trying to compile the details of the Rasmussen case. I'd been on it three days when I was stonewalled in Los Angeles with a Holmby Hills address and the phone number of Ellis Rasmussen. At 6 o'clock, a liveried chauffeur in immaculate uniform stepped up to me at the desk. Mr. Dollar? Yes? My name is Stopper, sir. I have Mr. Rasmussen's car outside. Well, gee whiz, (laughs) Stopper. Ain't it the truth, sir? A few minutes later, when we turned into the lush green Holmby Hills section, I had a suspicion I was about to deal with a bona fide millionaire. When we parked in front of the big two-story colonial home and a man with graying hair and swallowtail coat stepped out of the door, well, I knew I was going to meet the real article. I'm Hardy, sir. Hello, Hardy. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen is waiting for you. Uh, This way, please. We stopped in front of a huge paneled door. Hardy tapped on it once, then pulled on the knob. As we entered, a tall man with a shock of pure white hair rose from his chair and turned toward us. This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Rasmussen. I want about four fingers of sour mash. What do you want? (laughs) You took the words right out of my mouth, Mr. Rasmussen. Uh, Very good, sir. He's a pretty nice fellow. We're all pretty nice fellows around here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Thanks. Could you hand me that lighter? Oh, sure. Here. Thank you. What are you doing in Los Angeles? Why, federal underwriters of Hartford wrote a blanket policy for all Imperial Rubber Company employees. Your son was an executive with Imperial when he was killed in Malaya last spring. 
Federal owes his widow $25,000. I don't know where she is, Mr. Dollar. I see. I doubt if you do. Let me put it this way. I never met the young lady. Fred married her one night in Elko, Nevada. Two days later, they were on their way to Malaya. Six months there, and the development station was raided by guerrillas one night. And I suddenly no longer have a son. Have you eaten your dinner, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I wouldn't want to trouble you. Uh, Hardy, set a place for Mr. Dollar. Uh, very good, sir. Well? Well, I thought she might phone me when she got back to the States. She never did. Never a letter, nothing. I'm old and sick, but I still want to see the girl my son married. It's not an easy thing to lose a son, Mr. Dollar. And I lost a good one. I lost the best son a man ever had. I'm sure you did, sir. To your son. To Fred. During dinner and afterward over coffee and liqueurs, I listened to the story of Ellis Rasmussen's life. It came from the lips of an old man who was dying, but in whose eyes I could see reflected the memories of a brawling, bustling life that started in an Oklahoma oil field and moved to Alaska and Arabia and Africa. More and more during the talk, I began to know his lost son, for in everything the old man had to say about himself, I could sense an unmistakable reflection of his son. Finally, I thanked him and left. Uh, if I may say so, I do hope you'll call soon again, sir. Mr. Rasmussen enjoyed your visit very much. I haven't seen him so much like his old self since we received the terrible news of young Mr. Rasmussen's death. He must have been quite a man, Hardy, young Fred Rasmussen. Ah, he was, sir. All of us miss him dreadfully. None of us ever met Mrs. Rasmussen, and we were most anxious to receive her, especially after young Mr. Fred's death. I imagine so. Uh, the car is all ready, Mr. Dollar. Uh, good night, sir. Good night, Hardy. Fine night, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Stomper. Uh, yes, sir? I didn't want to press the point with Mr. Rasmussen, but... Now, maybe you can straighten me out. Did he approve of his son's marriage? Mm, let's put it this way, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Rasmussen approved of Mr. Fred... And if Mr. Fred got himself married, then Mr. Rasmussen approved of the girl. Between them two, they had that kind of understanding. Real people. Expense account item two, $1.98, telegram. To Personnel Division, Imperial Rubber Company, requesting a copy of all information they might have on Laura Olson Rasmussen. Item three, six dollars, one long distance phone call to the Universal Agent working the case in San Francisco. Mrs. Rasmussen left the Malaya Peninsula by boat from a town called Cochetti three days after the news of her husband's death. A week later, she booked plane passage in Hong Kong with Trans Pacific Airlines. She changed planes in Honolulu. She cleared the port authority in San Francisco. From there on, we lost her. Get a list of all the passengers who were on that plane. Okay. Get someone checking the hotels in the Bay Area. She might have checked into one when she hit Frisco. Okay. Now listen, we're looking for a woman whose husband was brutally murdered about two weeks before she got back to the States. If she's anything like I think, she was probably about at the end of a rope. Now start asking questions at places where people like that go. Right. On Wednesday morning, I rented a car. That's item four, twenty-five dollars and made the rounds. First stop, Los Angeles Board of Education. By 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I had found 35 Laura Olsons who had attended public school in Los Angeles and were more or less in the proper age bracket. The next day, the folder arrived from Imperial Rubber Company. Among other things, it contained a passport picture and a complete description of Laura Olson Rasmussen. She was a blonde girl with a pouting, sultry kind of mouth and wide, dark eyes. Yes? What do you want? I'm looking for Mrs. Frances Olson. Are you Mrs. Olson? I don't want to buy nothing. Do you have a daughter named Laura Olson? Are you a policeman? No, I'm an insurance investigator. I'm trying to locate Laura Olson Rasmussen. Well, how'd you get this address? What's that? A picture of her. I see. That's my Laura. What about her? I've been trying to locate her for some time. Is she here? No, no, she ain't here. She ain't been here for five years. Do you have any idea where I can find her? Friends, maybe? Other relatives? <laughs> you 
Dorothy and his Rasmussen now? Yes, she married a man named Fred Rasmussen. Married? Well, ain't that just something? You didn't know your daughter had been married, Mrs. Olson? How would I know? How would I know anything about her? Saturday at noon, a registered letter arrived from the agent in San Francisco containing the list of passengers who had been on the plane with her. Three of the names were in the Los Angeles area, including a Mr. Oberlin, who lived in Pasadena. For sure, I remember her. Real pretty. We sat together all the way from Honolulu. <laughs> What's up? We're trying to locate her, Mr. Oberlin. Did she happen to mention her plans when she returned to the States? Plans? You know, what hotel she might be staying at in San Francisco? Or if she was going on to another city? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, 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 not her. You say that very emphatically. Yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> You didn't have to show me a picture. You know, a guy always prays he'll meet someone like her on a plane, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, live it up. Yesterday's gone, she said tomorrow ain't here, and the only thing we got is today. Yeah, we had a swell time. You're sure about this? We were pretty chummy, pal, if you want the truth of it. Mr. Roblin, did she mention anything about being in Malaya before she boarded that plane? Uh-uh. Then she didn't tell you that her husband had been killed a week before. Killed? Oh. He was murdered by guerrillas in Malaya. No, she didn't mention that. She didn't mention that at all, Mr. Dollar. Johnny Dollar. This is Hardy, Mr. Dollar. How are you, Hardy? How's Mr. Rasmussen? He's not so well, sir. That's why I called. Could you possibly find time to visit him? Tonight? Uh, may I send a car right away? Is it serious? He's dying, sir. I knew why he wanted to see me. Have you located my daughter-in-law yet? No, I haven't located her, Mr. Rasmussen. But I know something about her. I know she drank whiskey and flirted with a fat salesman on an airplane all the way from Honolulu to San Francisco. I know her mother's a drunk. I know she didn't think enough of you or your son to contact you or anybody else when she got back. Mr. Rasmussen, it looks to me like your daughter-in-law is a first-class bum. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Our daily lives are sharply affected by world news. And for a complete roundup of the news every single weekday evening, just keep your dial on CBS Radio for the news broadcasts of our famous CBS newsmen, Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas. Hear up-to-the-minute news with Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas on CBS Radio. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Rasmussen Matter. <laughs> There was a black coupe with M.D. on the license parked in the driveway of the Rasmussen house when we pulled up. In the bedroom, a silvery-haired man in a black suit was sitting beside the bed that held Ellis Rasmussen. He was introduced as Dr. Butler. Then I shook the hand of Mr. Rasmussen. Someone suggested that Dr. Butler might like to use the library for his calls. And I was alone with the old man. If you want some whiskey, uh, keep it in the sideboard over there. Uh, not now, thanks. I, uh, I wish I had some news for you, Mr. Rasmussen. We're finding out things, but we haven't found her yet. What things? Oh, things. Nothing important. Dollar, if I judge you right, you know your business. And if you haven't found my daughter-in-law by now, you've certainly found out what kind of person she is. So tell me. I haven't met her. I don't know. You're being evasive. I don't work for you, Mr. Rasmussen. I'm an insurance investigator trying to locate a woman and pay off a claim. If I don't find her, the case will just have to sit. Unless you or someone else concerned makes a report to missing persons. Then the cops can take over, and maybe they should right now. My son was a fine man. I can look back on all the years I had with him and be proud of every year and every day. He married a girl named Laura Olson. I don't know where she came from or who she was, but I know my son wouldn't have married her unless he loved her, unless she loved him in return and was worthy of his love. 
You know it a lot, Mr. Rasmussen. Perhaps I should go to the police. No. No, don't do that. We'll find her, Mr. Rasmussen. We're getting it narrowed down. Well, I'd better leave now. As you say. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I want to see her. Yes, sir. I'm sorry I talked to you the way I did. Phone call for you, Mr. Dollar. Would you like to take it in there? Oh, yeah, sure. Keep an eye on him, Hardy. Uh, Trust me, sir. Johnny Dollar. This is Officer Daly, Los Angeles Police. Oh, yeah. You the insurance guy looking for a Laura Olson Rasmussen? Yeah, have you got anything? We got her. Huh? She's here with the rest of the girls in the drunk tank. A drunk tank will always smell of disinfectant. This one was no different. There are no bunks, no chairs, no blankets, no nothing. So you stand to sit on a concrete floor and wait for something to happen. The legal period is 24 hours. You get rebooked or you get released. It all depends. What's the story on her, Dollar? I've got a check for $25,000 for her. Gee, insurance money? Yeah. Quiet! Quiet in there! All right, quiet down! You girls better learn to get along. Which one? Back there, sitting on the floor. Oh, brother. What's the situation? If somebody comes up with bail, they can have her. Expense account item seven one hundred dollars bail. While I was waiting around, Officer Daly broke open a file on her. A dozen aliases, a dozen charges, and one conviction for shoplifting. A career of petty thievery that began at the age of 16 and ran up into a 22nd year. Expense account item A, $35 telegrams. I sent wires to all parties concerned, all parties except Ellis Rasmussen, ordering a stop on their activities since Laura Olson Rasmussen had been found. Over there. Who are you? My name's Johnny Dollar. Thanks for getting me out. Why? I did it for a friend. Friend? I didn't know I had any. Expense account item nine, 20 cents, two cups of coffee. We had it in a diner across from the women's section of the main jail. I looked at Laura Olson Rasmussen while she drank the coffee. Looked at the blonde hair and the wide eyes and the pouting mouth. Looked at the woman who had once been the wife of Fred Rasmussen. What's the catch, mister? No catch. You put up a hundred dollars for me. I don't know you from a load of coal. No, you don't. Where do you live? I've been staying at the Piedmont Hotel. You know where it is? No. No, not many people do. Especially people with clean shirts. What have you been doing since you got back from Malaya? I've been getting along. You got something to do with Fred? You know about Malaya? I know about a lot of things. I've been looking for you for a month. So what? Why didn't you contact your father-in-law when you got back? Why should I? What would he care about me? He never met me. What I mean to him. Right now, since he no longer has a son, you mean everything to him. You're kidding me, mister. I wish I was kidding you. I wish to heaven I was kidding you. Well, what now? Oh, I want you to come over to my hotel with me. Oh, now, look. To sign some papers. I have a check for $25,000 for you. Who is that? Your husband was insured. You're his beneficiary. All you have to do is fill out an application. I'll give you the check. I don't believe it. It's true. Come on. 
Expense account item 10, $2, cab fare to my hotel. I took her upstairs with me, stood over her while she filled out the necessary papers. Outside of that, we didn't say a word. Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Stoffer, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Hardy asked me to phone you to see if there's any word. Oh, yes. Well, uh, what'll I tell him, Mr. Dollar? Tell him no luck yet, Stoffer. How is... How is the old man? About the same, sir. Counting on you, I think. I'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. Here you are. Okay. Thanks. Here's your check. Anything else? Nope. That's it. Okay. See you around sometime. Sure. Fred told me about a man named Stoffer who worked for his old man for years. Was that him on the phone just now? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to say to the old man, but I did know I was hoping that if Rasmussen had to die, that he'd die before anybody told him the kind of daughter-in-law I'd turned up. I didn't want to be in on that. Expense account item 11, $83, hotel bill. I checked out at 5.30, picked up my airline tickets at the desk, that's item 12, then sat around the lobby for five minutes. Item 13, two drinks for myself. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Oh. I read in the paper that Ellis Rasmussen is dying. Is that true? That's true. Can I invite you down? Suit yourself. What are you drinking? Nothing. I know why you didn't tell them. You found me, and I don't blame you. Fred's dad is anything like Fred was, and I know how you felt finding me the way you did. Let's forget it, Mrs. Rasmussen, shall we? I'd like to meet Fred's father. So you want to meet him, huh? The human thing would have been to see him when you came back. But not a line, not a word. That old man in that house knows his son was really a man. And on that basis, he believes without seeing you that his son married a real woman. He had love and sympathy and help and devotion and, and all the things you don't seem to have any use for waiting for you in that house. He... Oh, never mind. I loved Fred. Loved him from the first minute I saw him. You know what I was doing when I saw him? was serving cocktails in a place like this. He didn't ask me what kind of a family I came from, whether I was good or bad. He just put one of those big arms around me one night and said, you're mine. He said that to me. He said it because he loved me. No one ever loved me. No one. But he did. I told him who I was and where I came from, and all he said was, you're with me now. We, we went to Malaya together, and I never knew in all of my life what I knew then. How it was to be wanted by someone who was decent, kind. And then he was killed. He told me one afternoon when I was in Kachetti. I took a boat and then I took a plane back here. Go on. I want to see Fred's father... I took a car to the house and, and I saw what kind of a house and what kind of people his family were. I didn't go in. Couldn't you see me, cheap, rotten, dirty little me? Couldn't you see me walking in there and saying, I'm me? Couldn't you see that mother of mine moving in? What would that have done to the old man? It would have crushed out his whole memory of Fred. But don't think, Mr. Dollar, I haven't got my memory, too. 
I didn't drink that away. I was... I was loved by a man. And I loved him back. I've still got that. I'm going out there pretty soon. Would you like to meet him? Do you think I can? I think so. I think so very much. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I've been waiting in the lobby. I thought you might be here. Uh, how'd do, miss? Stuffer, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Rasmussen. Well, my, my. I'm mighty pleased to meet you. The boss will be mighty happy. She dried her eyes in the car. I didn't say much. She didn't say much. But in the half hour it took to get out to Holmby Hill, something happened to her again. The something that must have happened when the big arm went around her shoulders the first time. Good evening. Mrs. Rasmussen, Hardy. How do you do, Mrs. Rasmussen? We're very happy to see you. Thank you, Hardy. Fred spoke of you often. That was kind of Fred. Uh, this way, please. Come in, come in. Uh, I think you can introduce Mrs. Rasmussen, Mr. Dollar. Uh, ring if you need me, sir. I'm scared. Laura, if there ever was a man for you not to be scared of, it's that man in there. Oh, how, how can I tell him about myself? I've been in jail. I can't... Watch. Well, Mr. Dollar, come in. I'd... I've brought someone for you to meet, Mr. Rasmussen. Come here. You'd be my son's Laura. Yes, you're Laura. Hello. Yes. Oh, now, there, there, here, here. Now, look, look, us Rasmussen's mustn't meet like this with tears. There's so much I have to tell you. No, there's nothing you have to tell me. What? Let me put my arm around you. There. Now... Feel it? Mm-hmm. You're my daughter. Do you understand that? Yes. Oh, yes. Then that's all the explanations we need between us. Yes. Uh, uh, Hardy, Hardy. Uh, yes, Mr. Rasmussen? Uh, bring, uh, bring Mrs. Rasmussen some brandy, I think. And I'll have some sour mash, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Make mine sour mash, too, Hardy. Very good, sir. Expense account item 14, 40 bucks, miscellaneous. Item 15, 35 dollars, stenographic. Expense account total 1,965 dollars. Remarks? The old man's got a few weeks more. Laura's moving into the house with him to take care of him. She won't be telling him a lot of things about herself. She doesn't have to. You should have stood there like I did and seen that big arm go around her shoulder when he said, You're my daughter. Yeah. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Folks abroad want to know more about us Americans, how we live, how we eat, what we do in our leisure time. You know something? You can help promote international goodwill by corresponding with someone abroad. For the name of a correspondent, write to Letters Abroad, 45 East 65th Street, New York. That's Letters Abroad, 45 East 65th Street, New York. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one cute tiny little mouse, that's right, mouse, almost scares a big insurance company out of business. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. 
Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Eric Snowden, Roy Glenn, Will Wright, Frank Nelson, and Jack Crucian. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Welcome back. Um, this was really um, a very unusual and interesting episode of Johnny Dollar. I, I thought actually from the first that Johnny was probably jumping to some uh, conclusions with the judgments. The flirting on the plane and the getting drunk, neither one of them you know, look all that good. But it's one of those things I, I think that... Uh, particularly when you're dealing with loss and loneliness, becomes uh, understandable. It was true that she was drunk, but she was not a drunk. It was not a habitual thing. But overall, this is an episode that just takes you by surprise. Just because I think in Johnny Dollar, um, you're so used to Evil, despicable, not nice, dr- uh, old, rich men. And um, I-, I think that we get something very different here. Everybody is, uh, we kind of misjudge everyone in this story. It was definitely powerful. Like I said, it's a bit of an oddball for uh, Johnny Dollar. In early parts of the episode, it kind of reminded me of the five-part serial, The Broderick Matter. And while it does have some similarities, it's also uh, just incredibly different. It's definitely its own story. It's just an incredibly moving story about love and uh, and the unexpected ways it comes. Now, this whole uh, story is just a continuation of the... Uh, relationship between father and son. This wasn't a Christmas episode. It aired on December 16th, but it was kind of, uh, I think, a more heartwarming mood uh, for the holiday season. We will skip over the Christmas episode for now. We will come back to that when we get to uh, Christmas this year, so we'll, we'll hear that in a few months. But overall, a very memorable and very different sort of Johnny Dollar story, and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, well, on to some listener comments and feedback. And on our listener comments and feedback now, where we turn, uh, Bobby comments, uh, listening to this one now, uh, regarding uh, the Royal Street matter. Glad that Johnny is, uh, down south in my area. And, uh, it, that's one thing that's nice about Johnny Dollar. Locations all across the United States. I believe he got into close to, uh, 40 states from the documentation I've seen. Never quite made it to Idaho, but uh, he definitely got around, even though there were a lot of cases uh, that weren't just uh, in and about Hartford. All right, well, that will do it for today. We'll be back tomorrow uh, with uh, with uh, police headquarters, and then join us back here next Friday for another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meanwhile, uh, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.